It is time for our first program of the night. Our first program is being presented by Thomas M. Simkin, who is a BSI member. He won the Montgomery Morley Prize a few years back for having the best article published in the Baker Street Journal. Um, Tom, the floor is yours when you're ready. Thanks very much, Greg. And um, if you wouldn't mind putting up uh, slide one, I would be grateful. Um, first of all, it's a real privilege and pleasure to speak to this August group the historic six Napoleons of Baltimore. Um, and I'm really delighted to, uh, to be here before you. I thought that today, if you'll indulge me, that uh, we would engage in that old Sherlockian pastime of the great game where we go on a flight of fancy bolstered by uh, impeccable logic. Well, my logic might be packed a bit, but um, I hope that you'll enjoy the presentation on the rise of Mycroft Homes. And there you can see in the background uh, the building of which he was a denizen, Whitehall. Uh, you may remember this quote um, from uh, Mycroft's younger brother. You are right in thinking that he is under the British government. You would also be right in a sense if you said that occasionally he is the British government that uh, in the Bruce Partington plans. Um, uh, but the question is, when and how did Mycroft become, in quotes, the British government? Uh, next slide, please, Greg. I hope that you will join me today in applying the Younger Holmes methods of deduction and reasoning to form a theory about the rise of Mycroft Holmes. The next slide, please. Our first clue in this regard is revealed in the adventure of the Bruce Partington plans in which the younger Holmes reveals to Watson the true nature of Mycroft's central role in the British government. He makes the point that Mycroft had already occupied his lofty perch some years earlier in fact, when Watson first encountered him in the adventure of the Greek interpreter. However, at that earlier date, Watson had had no need to know. And it was only with the passage of time that Sherlock came to trust him sufficiently to reveal the truth. So we know that at the time of the Greek interpreter, Mycroft had already ascended. But when was the adventure of the Greek interpreter? There are several theories. Uh, Baring Gould asserted that the Greek interpreter took place in September 1888, but that seems off since the case took place in summer. Um, Zeisler, I think, had a similar date in mind. Um, but um, one theory that I'd like you to consider um, concerns an obscure discussion between Holmes and Watson in the Greek interpreter that may shed some light literally. But before we do that, let me just uh, explain. Uh, what I'm going to attempt to do with your help is to set sort of the outer parameters of when Mycroft would have risen to power uh, and the earliest time um, at which we could imagine he rose to power. And we'll then have a sort of narrow band of when Mycroft actually became, air quotes, the British government. And we may be able to draw some conclusions as to how and why that occurred. So for the first, sort of our outer bound, if you will, is going to be when we knew for certain that he was already in that lofty position. Um, may I have the next slide, please, Greg? The obliquity of the ecliptic. Do you remember this discussion in the Greek interpreter? And probably like me, you ask yourself, what on earth is the obliquity of the ecliptic? Um, you may remember that in the case uh, that Holmes, after tea on a summer evening, was discussing the obliquity of the ecliptic, meaning Earth's axial tilt within its orbital plane. Now, uh, that is quite a remarkable thing, given Holmes' famous observation that he neither knew nor cared whether the sun revolved around the earth or vice versa. 
and made clear that that was because there were no practical implications whatsoever for his work. So why this sudden interest in an even more obscure and subtle aspect of astronomy, namely his interest in the obliquity of the ecliptic of all things? Presumably, it's because there was a practical implication of some sort, something observable, even measurable. Uh, next slide, please. Given the timing of Holmes's discussion with Watson, his reference could only be relevant to the advent of the summer solstice, when the obliquity of the ecliptic would make this the longest day of the year, at least in the Northern Hemisphere where Holmes and Watson were of course situated. And uh, the summer solstice, by the way, occurs exactly when the Earth's axial tilt is closest to the sun at its maximum of 23 degrees and such. Uh, certainly, it could be useful to Holmes to know when the days are longer and afford a measure of sunlight after normal hours. The practical implications for perpetrating crimes are obvious, and probably it was brought to mind by the fact, in this instance, the, because Holmes and Watson were taking tea on a summer evening not uh, mid-afternoon, as of course would have been the norm in London in those days. So um, now for a bit of inductive reasoning. So uh, next slide, please, Greg. Now the summer solstice typically occurs on June 21. Holmes and Watson's conversation takes place on a Wednesday evening for the discussion with Mr. Mellis. Canonically speaking, the only year subsequent to Holmes and Watson's initial meeting on the one hand, and prior to Reichenbach on the other, in which the summer solstice took place on a Wednesday, was 1882. Therefore, I think you'll agree it's pretty safe to conclude that the Greek interpreter case dates itself, namely June 21, 1882. So I would postulate that we can set that date as the outer boundary of when Mycroft actually rose to power, since he obviously was firmly ensconced in Whitehall by that time. Now that we have one boundary set, June 21, 1882, as the by that point, certainly he was in, in the authority. Now let's attempt to set the inner boundary of time by which Mycroft became so prominent and then let's see if we can narrow things down just a bit. Um, to do so, let us turn back the clock together to the other great game. That is the real life great game between Britain and Russia predominantly in the Indian subcontinent. Next slide, please. Specifically, the Second Anglo-Afghan War, which lasted from 1878 to 1880. And here is a map of Afghanistan dating from 1878. So you can get at least a vague picture of what we're talking about. Now, um, next slide, please. After tension between Britain and Russia in Europe was suspended through the June 1878 Congress of Berlin, Russia began to get frisky and turned its attention to Central Asia as a new avenue for expansionism. And that same summer, Russia sent an uninvited diplomatic mission, in air quotes, to Kabul. The Emir, Sher Ali Khan, tried unsuccessfully to keep the Russians out because he knew their game to try and uh, gain influence at his expense. Once the Russians, however, managed to squeeze themselves in and were exerting their influence. Unsurprisingly, the British demanded that Sher Ali also accept a British mission as well to counterbalance Russian influence. However, the Emir not only refused to receive a British mission, he threatened to stop it by force if it were dispatched. The British undeterred dispatched a diplomatic mission to Kabul anyway in September 1878. And in due course, the mission was turned back by his forces as it approached the eastern entrance of the Khyber Pass, triggering, next slide please, 
the Second Anglo-Afghan War, battle of which is depicted here, um, a British force of about 40,000 troops penetrated Afghanistan at three different points. Sher Ali attempted to appeal in person to the Tsar for assistance in dealing with the British, but unable to reach him, he returned to Mazar-e Sharif in Afghanistan, where he died. Next slide, please. With British forces occupying much of the country, Sher Ali's son and successor, who you can see here, Mohammed Yaqub Khan, signed a treaty with the British in May 1879. And you see the uh, chief British negotiator on the left there, more of him soon, um, in return for an annual subsidy and vague assurances of assistance in case of foreign aggression, Yaqub relinquished control of Afghan foreign affairs to the British. British representatives were installed in Kabul and other locations. British control was extended to the Khyber Pass and Afghanistan ceded various frontier areas to Britain. Faithfully, the British army then withdrew which may be seen in retrospect as a terrible error. Next slide, please. Soon afterwards, after the British imposed this one-sided treaty on Afghanistan, making it sort of a vassal state, they pulled out all their forces. Um, and almost immediately thereafter, an uprising in Kabul led to the slaughter of Britain's resident in Kabul pictured here, that is uh, Sir Louis Cavagnari, as well as all his guards and all his staff in September 1879. This provoked the second phase of the Second Afghan War, where British forces now went into central Afghanistan and defeated the Afghan army on 6 October 1879 and occupied Kabul. Yaqub Khan, who had signed that treaty um, with uh, the subsequent uh, victim, Sir Louis Cavagnari, um, was suspected of complicity by the British in the massacre of the British resident and his staff, and he was removed from power by the British. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Pardon me. The British were considering a number of possible political settlements, including placing Yaqub's brother, Ayub Khan, pictured to the top left, who was the heir presumptive on the throne. But ultimately, they decided to install his cousin, pictured bottom right, instead, his cousin Abdurrahman Khan as the emir. Um, now, what did they do with Yaqub, Yaqub's brother, Ayub Khan, top left? Well, apparently, they decided to do nothing. They left him to his own resources. In retrospect, another terrible error for Ayub Khan, who had been serving as governor of Herat, rose in revolt and led his forces against the British. This led to a conflict with which I venture to say some of us have a passing familiarity. But next slide, please. The Battle of My Wand. Yes, that's what led to the Battle of My Wand. The Battle of My Wand in July 1880. The forces of Ayub Khan utterly defeated a British detachment, a rare rout of British forces, which was traumatic for the British leadership, polity, and public. By the way, according to the Royal Berkshire and Wiltshire Regiment's website, this action also inspired Sir Arthur Conan Doyle to base his character, Dr. Watson, on the regiment's medical officer, who was present that day, Surgeon Major A.F. Preston, who was wounded at the Battle of My Wand. Um, Greg, if it's all right, I'd like to just uh, recite a short verse by Rudyard Kipling, who researched meticulously the Battle of My Wand and included a poem about the action in his Barrack Room Ballads collection and a short excerpt from that poem that day. There was 30 dead and wounded on the ground we wouldn't keep. No, there wasn't more than 20 when the front began to go, but Christ, along the line of flight, they cut us up like sheep, and that was all we gained by doing so. I heard the knives behind me, but I durstn't face my man, nor I don't know where I went to, because I didn't halt to see. 
till I heard a beggar squealing out for quarter as he ran, and I thought I knew the voice, and it was me. We was hiding under bedsteads more than half a march away. We was lying up like rabbits all about the countryside, and the major cursed his maker because he lived to see that day. And the colonel broke his sword across and cried. And here we can see a depiction of the battle and also uh, a map of the action at my wand. Uh, next slide, please, Greg. Let us now consider what Mycroft's younger brother had to say about Mycroft's capabilities. And I believe his comments in the Bruce Partington plans to be dispositive. The conclusions of every department are passed to him, and he is the central exchange, the clearinghouse, which makes out the balance. All other men are specialists, but his specialism is omniscience. So I pose the question to the house. Do you believe that Mycroft Holmes was in charge of British policy during this period, which saw a string of strategic policy blunders by the British culminating in the massacre, the Battle of, Bi of My Wand? And I would say no. Next slide, please. As further evidence, when Mycroft's younger brother describes Mycroft's policy proficiency, he instinctively cites several areas of Mycroft's particular strengths, notably including the Indian subcontinent. This is in, of course, the adventure of the Bruce Partington plans. Again, we might well ask the question, um, could Mycroft Holmes have been in charge of British policy involving the Indian subcontinent during this terrible period? I think we would again say no. Now, that helps us set that earlier pillar, if you will, I was talking about um, in terms of Mycroft's rise to power. Surely he wasn't in charge in this terrible period leading up to my wand. Surely he wasn't in charge and, and considered to be omniscient. Certainly he wasn't omniscient concerning the Indian policy of Britain. Uh, so I think it's safe to say he simply wasn't in charge then. And we can assume that his rise began after this period. Um, and by September 1st, 1880, just a few months later, there was a dramatic shift in British policy, leading to a decisive reversal of fortunes for the British. Next slide, please, Greg. What was the aftermath? of my wand. Well, the main British force from Kabul decisively defeated Ayub Khan, who had led the uprising on September 1, 1880 at the Battle of Kandahar, bringing his rebellion decisively to an end with his crushing defeat. Amir Abdul Rahman Khan confirmed the Treaty of Gandamak, leaving the British in control of the territories previously ceded by Yaqub Khan. I didn't see it anything once before, but I was able to get my internet connection. Let's see, where were we? So I was just saying that um, the main British force from Kabul decisively defeated Ayub Khan, and that, uh, you remember that cousin who was brought in as the Emir, Abdurrahman Khan, he confirmed the Treaty of Gandamak, leaving the British in control of the territories ceded by Yaqub Khan, and ensuring British control of Afghanistan's foreign policy in exchange for protection and a subsidy. In other words, basically vassal state um, Afghanistan. Uh, Amir Abdur Rahman Khan went on to achieve consolidation of Afghanistan and the British abandoning the provocative policy of maintaining a British resident in Kabul, but having achieved all their other strategic objectives were able finally to withdraw their forces. So suddenly, British fortunes had completely reversed. The next slide, please, Greg. Hence, we may infer that Mycroft occasionally was the British government, starting from around September 1st, 1880, the Battle of Kandahar, a position in which he was well-established 
less than two years later at the time of the Greek interpreter, namely June 21, 1882. Now, given that time frame, we may further theorize that his great success in reversing British fortunes in the Indian subcontinent in the aftermath of Maiwand helped propel him to the heights of British government. And hence, I would say, the rise of Mycroft Holmes. Next slide, please. So I'd like to thank you for joining me in this exercise of logic, playing the great game of Sherlockian scholarship uh, as applied in this instance to the real life game of Anglo-Russian rivalry in Afghanistan and the rise of Mycroft Holmes. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Tom. Do we have any questions for Tom at this time? If you can just unmute and ask your questions. Julie, you have a question? I do. Um, given the, the timeline you gave us, do you think that Mycroft gained the position higher up in the government directly because of the previous miscalculations in Afghanistan? I think that's a good, a good guess. Um, we, it's a, we're on a little shakier ground but in, in, in making that assertion, but uh, the facts seem suggestive, don't they? Uh, so in the absence of facts, your facts are better? Do you think? I think that's true of any argument. They're at least as good as your absence of facts. That's right. <laughs> okay. No, in, in, in the case of, you know, just determining logically when he wasn't in power, we can take it up to the Battle of Maiwand. When exactly after that he rose, whether it was in the period leading up to the Battle of Kandahar or because of the Battle of Kandahar is uncertain and unclear. That's why I'd say we're on shakier ground with that. But certainly around that period, and perhaps because of that, you could imagine that would be why he rose to power. So yes. Thank you. You bet. Thanks for the question, Julie. Any other questions for Tom? Edith, do you have one? Yep. Um, that was a great presentation, thank you. Um, thank you. I was wondering, I, you seem to be saying that, um, that well, you seem to be inferring that when there were policy failures, quote unquote, that that indicated that Mycroft was not in power. And I just wondered whether these may not have been failures, but maybe he was sacrificing pieces on the chessboard. Well, it's uh, you're, you're a very Machiavellian thinker. I admire that. I'm not really sure that that would be the case though, because, you know, it was such a devastating series of defeats. Um, which, I mean, with perfect hindsight, you could anticipate. I mean, really, you know, you impose an unequal treaty and you leave your guy in charge of bossing them around and then you pull out all your troops. I mean, you know, what were they thinking? Um, it seems on the surface of it to have been just a, what it, what it was probably a, a blunder. Um, so uh, also the Battle of Maiwan, I mean, that just was a scar on the British psyche for so long. You know, they were unaccustomed to this idea that indigenous population would be able to massacre, you know, well-trained, well-equipped British troops. And uh, it just took such a, a, a blow. It was, it was such a blow, I guess I should say, for the British. It's hard to imagine them doing that on purpose. Um, so it's a great question and it certainly, you know, I can't prove or disprove it either way for obvious reasons, but um, I would put my money on the idea that this was just a lot of failures that they finally figured a way out of. And therefore my supposition is Mycroft wouldn't have been there for those and then risen to power based on his policies leading up to my wand, but we know he came into power sometime before the Greek interpreter. So, you know, this is a pivotal point in history where they suddenly reverse their fortunes. And I see that more as cause and effect, but obviously less with less evidence. But I appreciate your question very much. 
Any more questions for Tom? Uh, Jerry, you have a question. The only the only problem that I have in your logic is Tom is that uh, Island Awana took place before my one and it was a much bigger disaster. And if that were the case, why didn't Mycroft rise to power that much sooner um, after Island Awana than my wand? If that is what you're basing your assumption on, well, you'd have to ask the palace that question. I think <laughs> that. Um, I think that uh, you know, it's uh, it's more like reverse logic or inference because um, if he had risen to power after that, would my wand have taken place? And I would say no, because you know this is this brilliant omniscient expert in in the south uh, in South Asia, right? So what I'm trying to do is determine when he wouldn't have been, and uh, so if he had been in you know earlier. And there were still disasters. Why would he have risen? You know, well, think, would he have been fired? So, so I take your point, but I don't agree respectfully. I think that um, I think that it is more likely that they just came to the end of their rope. We can't prove it or disprove it, but I do. No, appreciate no, I, I, the I, know, I totally, question. no, I told no, I, I just, I mean, Lytton's, Lytton's policy was masterly inactivity, and I believe Mycroft Holmes would have been far more active as opposed to inactive, and therefore I think he would have had a whole lot more going on behind the scenes than what was taking place under Lytton. So that's he, that's he might view. have. Although, you know, he himself was pretty lethargic and inactive. So you never know. <laughs> Not in his mind, though. <laughs> you never know. That's true. He is known for leaving projects unfinished, so. Very Great true. question, though. And with that, Thomas, we thank you for a very interesting presentation. And we are very honored to say that you are now Napoleon CCLXX. I, 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 or excuse me, IV. Um, you're now Napoleon 274. So this is why we don't use Roman numerals a lot, folks, because we don't know how to translate them. So um, normally you'd be wearing the blue carbuncle for the rest of the meeting. At a future meeting when we're in person, you will have a chance to fight all the others who've also became a Napoleon during the virtual process here. So thank you very much, Tom. Quite an honor. Thank you. So now, was this about 15 years since you became a pot?